Hey, it's Travis Lane Jenkins. Welcome to episode number 101, 101 of the Entrepreneur's Radio Show, a production of Rockstar Entrepreneur Network. Today, I'm going to introduce you to Jeffrey Zorofsky. Just like all of our guests, Jeffrey is a rock star entrepreneur. One of the things that you may find interesting beyond the great advice in this show is that he's built his business in excess of the $20 million mark with his business partners, if I remember correctly. Although before we get started, I want to ask you if you've ever heard of the Circle of Five. The circles of five is the people that you spend, or it refers to the the people that you spend the majority of your time around. And ultimately what it says is those people will have the biggest influence on your success, or of course your failure. In fact, you may or may not know this, I don't know how long you've listened to the show, but I'm a living example of this. I come from a very, very poor background And for me, it all started as I found ways to surround myself with people that supported me, that inspired me, that taught me, and also challenged me to become more. And those people were outside my family. So over time, as you have probably already figured out, I had pretty incredible levels of success. And I tell you this because I want you to be conscious of the people that you place yourself around. If they're negative and they can't provide you with the inspiration and and the support that I just mentioned, then find new groups of people to spend your time with. Even if the only options at first are books or even podcasts like this. Now, I know you're already on this path because you're listening to the show, although I want to encourage you to constantly upgrade your surroundings, evolve, get beyond it. I've gotten to where I've completely quit listening to the news because it's just nothing but a a constant perpetuation of negativity uh, with people with very specific agendas. So I think you got my message. All right, so just uh, focus on that and constantly upgrade your surroundings. Now, in the last episode, I told you that I wanted to recognize some of our great listeners for taking the time to write a review on the show on Stitcher. Uh, Now, we just started getting some listeners on Stitcher. I'm hoping to build that network out as large as iTunes, although we've got quite a ways to go. In fact, I wanted to say... Uh, thank you to C. Munchoff on Stitcher for the five stars, uh, five star review, and uh, or well, it's two separate things: the five stars and the review. The title reads: "The show is a must for entrepreneurs." And then I want to read something in inside the message here because it's it's a very important uh, point that I want to drive home. And the reviews, uh, the the person said, I don't know if it's a he or she, uh, C. Munchoff wrote, I don't personally know a lot of successful people I can chat with, but this show gives me an opportunity to meet some people who have made it. Turns out most of them are normal people who just focused on getting really, really good at something and stuck to it. You're exactly correct. That's what this show is exactly about. I'm so glad that you picked that out of the show, and you're exactly right. Now, before we transition to the interview, I also want to remind you that there's two ways that you can take these interviews with you on the go. Or actually, there's three ways. You can go through iTunes, Stitcher, or Android. And uh, both of them have... Uh, poor search function. So what you can do is go to rockstarentrepreneurnetwork.com, click on the the iTunes, the Stitcher, or the and- Android right there on the menu bar, and it will take you directly to the podcast where you can subscribe to the show there. 
If you would uh, be so kind to take a minute and write a review, I would really, really appreciate it. Patch Abilities, I'm going to read and talk about your review on Stitcher in the next episode. So hang in there. I'm, I'm going to get you next. Uh, one last thing. Be sure and stay with us until the very end if you can because I want to share a quote with you. So without further ado, let's get down to business. Jeffrey, welcome to the show. Thanks so much. I'm so happy to be here. Yeah, yeah, man. Uh, I've got a lot of things that I want to talk to you about, but uh, but uh, let's let's go down this path first. Of if if you don't mind giving a, give us the backstory of of how what brought you to where you're at today and how you found success uh, with what you're doing right now. Sure. How how far back do you want me to go? Uh, when I was eight years old, I started cooking, and I love food, and I it was a way of uh, just sort of. Uh, keeping myself busy in the afternoons after school, and um, and I just fell in love with it. My grandma kind of took me, taught me how to cook, and then uh, it was a hobby for a long time. And when I was in college, uh, at some point, I, I realized I needed to pay my way through college, and so um, I just started cooking. But I, but if I was going to cook, I wanted to cook at the you know some of the better restaurants, places that I admired, not so much just uh, flipping eggs somewhere. So uh, I, although I've done that as well, um, but uh, I ended up cooking for about. Uh, two years in college to the point where I was, I fell in love with it and I almost, uh, you know, didn't pursue the career. I definitely didn't pursue the career that I was uh, intended to do, which is become a lawyer and, and probably a politician. Um, and I ended up, uh, just falling in love with the restaurants and, and kitchens. And, um, so I ended up, uh, going to culinary school, uh, in New York City at the, the French Culinary Institute. Um, and, um, you know, really made my way through the, the New York City culinary scene. Um, worked at some of the better restaurants here. One point, though, I recognized that uh, I didn't want to be in the kitchen anymore, and I, I had some more entrepreneurial uh, spirit inside of me, and so I, I uh, started my own business, which was kind of a marketing company related to hospitality, right. um, and, and I tried that out, and I had a lot of success there, but uh, most of it was based on selling, and I wasn't, I wasn't, uh, I, was, I think I was a natural uh, connector, but I wasn't, I didn't enjoy sales. Right. And so um, I ended up, ended up selling that business to uh, one of my competitors uh, who, and then I got, I got into business development and, and really learned, learned a little, little more of the trade of, of growing a business from some great people at a startup uh, that was in financial technologies. Um, and then uh, at some point uh, I, I missed that restaurant business, but I knew I wanted to go back to it, not with a, uh, not from the kitchen side or necessarily 100% from the operation side, but from the entrepreneurial side. And I wanted to build a business uh, based on the values that I that I thought were um, were key. And so, uh, and most of this had to do with where our food came from and how it was prepared right. uh, at the time. And uh, I uh, sent uh, I sent a note and a business plan to uh, my current partner Tom Clickio, who at the time was probably my most well-regarded chef, the chef that I regarded the most in, in the industry. Um, and he, uh, turns out he and my other partner, Cisha, uh, had already opened Witchcraft. And uh, I had, uh, they only had one store and it opened about a week before I met them. And um, my business plan was, was to grow that kind of business. And so they said, why don't you come on and you know, if you can't beat them, join them. So, you know, they beat me to getting the place open, uh, to getting the style of restaurant open first. But um, I joined on, and we, uh, in the last 11 years, we've, we've been partners, and we've you know, raised the capital, grown the business, and, and uh, uh, done all, got on that ride for the last uh, 11 years. And so um, it's been good. We, we're at uh, 17 stores, uh, which perhaps in across the country. We've got them in San Francisco and New York, and then we've got a, a fine dining restaurant named River Park here in New York as well, which is quite uh, successful and it's a big, it's a big operation. And um, we have uh, close to 400 employees now. We started with 15 in our first store. So, wow, that's um, that, that's that's, Im- that's, that's impressive. Ride. Yeah, that's impressive. So, so uh, are all of this is the business a franchise model, or do you guys own all of it? All owned and operated, uh, and you know we're actually at the point now. Where we're considering um, different, you know, different potential growth strategies. Not the least of which is, you know, franchises and, and, and licenses and, and international development, as well as um, 
you know, kind of getting getting into partnerships with people who can who can really help us accelerate it. Um, real estate is, is, is the name of the game in this business. Uh, right. pe- people in real estate, but real getting to real estate is very important. So, um, you know, figuring out figuring out how to how to you know how to hack that model is going to be key. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. A lot of people don't realize that, but you know, like McDonald's is, owns some of the most premier real estate in the world, right? Yeah, that's actually, uh, you make a great point. That's something we talk about regularly, which is um, whether, if we can get a chance to start owning real estate, that's great. But the fact that they own that and they sort of, you know, that, that's key to the success of, of the franchisees and also the, the company owned stores is, is really important. Right. So, you know, what's interesting about your story, from my perspective, is uh, is the the business acumen uh, and how you learned that and how you married that with your desire, with your experience with a chef. You know, they're they're kind of polar opposites, right? And so, how how, um, how did you marry those? Um, I think you know a lot of it was making a lot of mistakes uh, along the way, and just sort of you know reacting very quickly. I was young, and so um, you know just like you know when a kid falls down and. Um, you know, when a kid falls down and gets back up, he forgets the pain pretty quickly. Right. Um, I think when you're young, you're, you're very resilient, and you need to be, and you need to take a lot of risks and, and try things out. And um, so um, when I switched over from cooking to business, uh, first thing I did was I um, reached out to my friends who were either attorneys or business folks or consultants and sort of asked their opinion about um, you know, doing this and what that would look like and, and, and uh you know what, they, what their opinion was of, of doing it and how it can be successful. And some, I really asked them, what are the things I don't know that are going to really come back to bite me? Um, and they, they told me the things. They, you know, we talked a lot about. I learned a lot about uh, legal and, and finance and governance more so than the, the actual, you know, the business of selling or or product and stuff like that. Because I had already had that I had an idea, and then I'm implementing that is just another project. But the the stuff that really could bite you is, is you know, the other stuff. And so um, got very lucky with uh, with some of the friends. And I mean, my brother was very helpful in uh, um, advising me at the time. And so um, once I got the bug for that, you know, it, it then became uh, every 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 moment in my life, in my life when I've had a, a challenge or something I didn't know or um, – would counter to what I was used to doing. Um, I would just reach out to people and ask their opinions or advice and, uh, you know, see who would be helpful. And, uh, that's always served me very well. And, uh, fortunate to have a big network uh, of people who are happy to do that. Right. So, so let me ask you as a chef, is that a right brain, uh, typically type position or a left brain? Oh, um, I get, I get confused. Uh, so remind the, me again. So right the right brain. The brain. Yeah, so the right brain is typically musicians, artists. I would I would I would associate chefs with artists, and so probably right brains. And 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 so it's interesting that you're originally supposed to be a lawyer, which is left brain stuff. And so yeah. uh, you know the and, and maybe that's why you didn't go down that path. So which one do you think it is? Well, actually, it's it's funny. I think I think some aspects of being a chef chef is a very unique position, and I think that's why. Um, really great chefs are, are also um, oftentimes very good businessmen. The, the, you've seen that now. You've seen the restaurant tour model, the chef restaurant tour model mm-hmm. emerge. Um, I think the, there's a combination between um, the right brain creative aspect of what it is that, that you need to do in order to make great, great food, but there's a uh, highly organized, at least the successful, really successful ones are very organized, highly organized. Um, at process and uh, implementation and um, you know, putting putting together a dish isn't just about creating something in the moment. It's actually about a lot of steps and planning. And when you put together a dish for a restaurant, different than cook at home, you have to think about pre-planning and, and how are you going to make, you're not making one of those, you're making 60, 80, 100 of those in the night. And so the process and the pickup of, of putting a dish together in under a couple of minutes when the tickets are coming in um, is, is quite a different, I would say it's more left-brain work because it's, it's just super organized um, process stuff. 
I, I agree with you. And, and, and so the interesting thing about uh, Chef, and of course, you know, this is your expertise, but the little bit that I do know, it's not only the ingredients that you put in, it's the order and how you treat those ingredients. And so that's a very process driven thing. And you've got to be able to convey that to other people so that they can repeat it. So that's, uh, you know, very close to perfecting a business model, isn't it? Yes, you really think about it. I mean, you know, e uh and the examples that Michael Gerber gives in that book, um, they really do translate when you're thinking about it. I don't think every chef actually goes about their business thinking about those issues as much as they, they really do um, focus pretty heavily on um, on the creativity. But once you once you get your you know, your butt kicked one night on a, on a service where um, – you know, there's a hundred people in the restaurant and, and food takes really too long to get out. You, you pretty quickly adjust and, and tweak a menu item to, to make it get out quicker and, you know, in a, in a certain amount of time. Because keep in mind, you're not, you're not just doing one dish at a time. You're probably putting up you know, anywhere between four and 16 plates at a time. And so you've got to be thinking about group and, and how quality food can be produced in certain size groups and such like that. So, um, it's really quite fascinating. And what, you know, when you think about good cooking and also uh, as a chef, it, it takes days sometimes to make a great dish. There's, there's stock that needs to be made a couple of days in advance. Mm-hmm. There's maybe another element that's made the day before, and then there's, there's the pickup. And so, um, that doesn't just happen overnight. I think it's, uh, uh, not only people would look at it going into the business as a chef, if they were to spend some time reflecting on it, uh, about, about that, they would, um, they would understand that that's really what's at work. Right. It's very, it sounds like a very dynamic uh, workplace, that, you know, kind of a learning <laughs> dynamic place that, to where you've got to dial it in and, and be consistent and refine the process all at the same time. Yeah, if you, so there's, there's a little bit of a distinction between a chef and a line cook. And so, um, you know, when you're a line cook, it is, it's, it's, like, it's like war every night. I mean, it's, it's overwhelming. I mean, it's not literally war, but it's, it's the, business function, the business equivalent of being bombarded with a lot of uncertainty and unknowns and um, there happens to be danger, there's fire, there's knives, there's, there's slippery stuff, there's heavy stuff, um, and there's hot plates and, and all this stuff. And so um, it is, um, that's one aspect of it. And actually you have to, the best line cooks I find are the ones who get really, um, you know, sort of in a zone and they're just, they're just cooking. They're really focused on cooking, they're very present at the stove, and they're not overwhelmed, they're well-prepared. Um, and the best chefs, I think, are ones who, who can understand that position and understand how it is to be good in that position, as well as help those people plan, you know, give them the tools and the organization and the, the thinking around uh, any particular menu idea um, and make sure that they can, they can execute it well uh, under those circumstances. So, mm, Yeah. Yeah, that definitely makes sense. So now, so when you see when you see sorry when you see a great kitchen run, um, you know everyone's got their style, but you can go into some of the best kitchens in the world, and they are quiet, very you know sedate kind of operations where people are just really head down and quiet and working and just it's just producing great food. And there's others who like to sort of run rock and roll kitchens, but um, both have their quality. I think of being highly organized and very focused. Right, yeah, and I I would imagine that's probably mostly based on the person that's driving that operations on how that environment is, right? Yeah, that personality is is key, right? That's where the personality of the kitchen comes from the chef, without question. Right, right. So uh, I don't, I don't know if you guys share this. Uh, you know, you, it sounds like you've built a pretty impressive business. What, what revenue threshold that are you guys at now? Do you uh, share that? We don't, we don't really discuss. Yeah, we don't really discuss it. But you know, we're we're north of twenty million. Nice. Good way Man, wow, that's an incredible accomplishment. You know, that's uh, in eleven years. You said. Yeah, just under eleven. It will be eleven in May. Wow, you know that's a that's a rocket ride. That's uh, uh, like a a thousandth of a percent of businesses ever achieve that level. You know, very few ever <laughs> achieve a million uh, uh, in av- uh, revenue, then five million, and then ten million, and then twenty million is a whole nother platform. So, 
So you guys definitely have have found the formula. And are you driving, as I understand it, you're driving a lot of the business metrics of this, or do I understand that correctly? Uh, me personally? Yeah, I mean, is, is, isn't that the majority of what you're spending your time on is driving the business aspects of this? Uh, I spend a lot of my time now on, uh, as, as the business evolves, I, I spend a lot of my time on uh, all aspects of the business. Uh, I, I really do see the whole, the whole floor, uh, and, and, and you know we have, have dedicated professionals who are running, you know, different aspects of the, of the business that are responsible for each each aspect of it. Mm-hmm. But um, um, but I like to be involved in you know. The, Food. I like to be involved in our culture. I like to be involved in our practices of hiring. I like to be involved in, you know, our, and I love being involved in the reporting and the metrics of it. I like being involved in our development. So I do like to play in all the fields because right now we're still we feel very small. We still feel like a startup in terms of, um, you know, what decisions need to be made about the next ten years. Uh, we're not at the point where I feel like. This is a, a business that everyone just you know is just going to go on its own. It's still that so dy- such uh, there's such some dynamic here that um, I feel still feel like it's in startup phase, um, and there are decisions that I want to be made that I want to be part of. Right. Um, having having said that, you know you, you can't you can't do this without a lot of process put in place, and so um, so there's there's you know there's a good balance there. Right. So, uh, you know, obviously you guys have figured something out to experience that type of growth. What, what do you feel like the key elements are to taking and scaling a business like that? And I understand that you're far from where you, what you really want to accomplish. But, you know, considering yeah. that so few people ever achieve that, what do you, what do you think, the, say, the top five things are to scaling a business to that level? I mean, uh, uh, in no particular order, but I think that the, uh, in no particular order, but I can say that the most important one is good people. And everyone uh-huh. talks about that and gives lip service to it, but um, having really dedicated professionals who understand the mission and are uh, understand you know the the, the manner in which we work uh, and and is, are willing to help define that as you grow is really important. So you want people who initially are coming on board, especially as you're growing a business, who are going to come on board and build business process. Um, um, Without losing their soul, they're going to build business process for their particular, you know, department or um, their responsibility, and that is key. If you don't get people who are just dedicated to it or willing to, you know, work morning, noon, and night, and, and you know, weekends, and and just have it all be perfect or be um, you know, top notch, uh, then you're not going to go anywhere. Mm-hmm. And so, we've been so fortunate to have some key people on our team. Um, who just they hold down the fort on what they're working on, and they grow it, and they build it, and they add systems, and they add process, and they, they build a scalable, um, you know, they really do build a scalable solution to, to to doing stuff that maybe shouldn't be done in, in in the restaurant business, but we've we've managed to do it. I mean, right. we serve, we cook, we cook out, we cook and serve over a ton of turkey, one ton of turkey a week, and we we still we still roast it in ovens like you would find in a fine dining restaurant, and we cut yeah. it by hand and. It's it's quite remarkable. So, um, people, having people to do that every day is incredible. Um, I'd say the next is um, really thinking about about culture of what kind of culture you want in your business, particularly around how you conduct your business. I think as you grow far too far too frequently, people forget about um, how you the process of business, not just business processes, but how do you make decisions together as a group? How do you make decisions about um, putting a new menu on the, uh, a new item on the menu or how do you make a decision about a real estate, uh, a real estate decision? And um, we have a very, uh, very good and, and uh, simple um, decision funnel that we go through that allows us to say yes and no to things uh, without really uh, getting personal interest involved without complication. So, um, you know, we ask four questions and we ask them in order because they're, it's, they're all important, but one's more important than the other. Um, we ask whether or not we like doing something. We ask um, whether or not our customers are going to like it second. We ask whether it's profitable or not. And then we ask, actually, we ask whether it's uh, yeah, profitable. And then we ask whether it's, uh, we're able to do it well everywhere. 
And if there's a no to any one of those questions, we just won't, we just won't continue. So I like um, that. So if, the, if those four get yeses, then uh, you know it's, it's a funnel, it's a pyramid that comes negative, you know, inverted pyramid that comes down and it funnels out. And if you got a yes, it's all then 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 it's a go. Um, hey, let me let me make sure I got that right. So it's do we like that? Will our customers like that? Is it profitable? And what was the fourth one? Uh, can we do it well everywhere? So uh, it's scalable. Okay. Ah, uh, okay. Can we and, go ahead. And one of the things when I say, "Do we like it?" Do our customers like it? Uh, on, the, on the "we like it" part, that is a that is a pure. That actually gives us the opportunity to um, first evaluate an idea based on pure um, our 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 instinctive aesthetic. You know, the, the aesthetics of of what it is we're trying to put out there. To me, that's the most important. We don't start with the profitability question. We don't start with the scalable question. Um, we don't even start with what our customers are going to like as much as what are we like. Because at the end of the day, people, I think, have trusted us uh, to um, determine or to put out there a product that we thought was good, that we know that they'll like. Right. So, um, and not the other way around. Uh, I think it's, you know, you get down to a, um, you don't differentiate yourself if you, if you start with uh, what our customers will like. Uh, um, that's, that's a great point. Yeah, so so that's that. And then, you know, the other, so that goes back to culture, which is, I think it's really important for um, the business owner to decide how do you run the business, not just how you do X, Y, and Z in your business, but how do you make decisions? How do you uh, support culture? How do you create uh, an environment in which um, the business itself has a, a way of, of operating? Um that's really important. Uh, I'd say, you know, another key thing is get a really good board of advisors. Um, you know, that's that's key. Um, even if it's informal, just get people around you who you can bounce ideas off of, who've either gone through it before um, or are specialists in things that you don't know about, and uh, and and really ping them for a lot of their advice. Um, that's that's really important. I mean, I think the other thing is. I'm so fortunate to have uh, a really day in and day out operating partner. It was mm-hmm. just the nature of our of our meeting, but um, I can't imagine having done this alone uh, with this growth. And frankly, having the checks and balances over decision making and 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 all the stuff I'm talking about in terms of culture and, and all, wouldn't be able to develop that on my own without someone else who had a, their own opinions and, and uh, uh, desires about what that should look like. Right. Um, so that's uh, four. Um, you know, I mean, the list goes on. But, yeah. Uh, I'd yeah. Say, well, then, you know, it's a, a great, a great people, a great culture, a good board of advisors surrounding you, and a business partner. They all get down to people at the end of the day, as far as I'm concerned. Right. Yeah. It, it, it doesn't have to be exactly five. And, and so I want to double back on some of this stuff. And in the very first one, I, I like the fact that you said in no specific order, because I believe strongly that there's not necessarily an, an exact formula for everybody. I believe there's frameworks to success. And so sometimes that, that means pulling a, a, a out of the first position and putting B in the first position because that's work, what works best in your business, right, or your unique situation. And and so, I, go ahead. No, I agree 100%. I think, I think frameworks is a good way of looking at it. Actually. Yeah. And and so the one thing that I wanted to ask you more specific questions on is is I like the the concept of good people and I totally agree with that. Uh, but how do you how do you go about getting good people? You know that's a that's a, a a term that's tough to get your arms around. How do you get the good people on board? Um, I think that stems really from that, that's where that's where the the mission and vision and personality of the founders founder or founders really comes into play because if, I mean, I think that's where if you spend, if I spend, if I spend more of my time um, recruiting and coaching and supporting and inspiring uh, the people who are going to do the work, um, you know, if you think about the Seth Godin and, and the tribe theory, right? Like my tribe has to be, not my customers, but has to be my employees and the people who work directly for me. And then they'll make their own tribes and then you've got this very network effect, viral effect of, of growing the mission of the business. So, um, you know, I think that's that's probably uh, the tops. Mm-hmm. Okay, so um, go ahead. 
I don't, I don't want to get in the way of your no, 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 no. It's just um, that's you know. Uh, I think that that's that's the best way in which we can um, recruit people is is through my network and through my you know my my personality my my desire to inspire them and create a vision. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, and then once I've done that to a core group of people, they're constantly going out there and doing the same thing. And I think that's really uh, profound. That's a, that's a good, I think, great organization. Yeah, I, I, and I like the idea of people uh, getting clear on your mission and then sharing that with the, the people uh, that you're potentially hiring because it, it everybody doesn't necessarily be need to be the carbon copy of one another, but they do need to be able to align on the mission of the business because I think that's what the the deeper driving force of maybe the common denominator is between all of these good people, right? Agreed on Agreed on yeah. Okay. So culture, that's another fuzzy term that, and, and you did definitely give us some, some descriptions on that, but what is culture? I mean, it's, that's another term that's hard to get your arms around and completely understand yeah. what it is. What, what do you feel like culture is? Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, with that question, you know, culture has been bandied around about, you know, ping pong tables and, 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 uh, Whatever else you know, catered lunch, whatever, and I, and I believe those things are are results of a good culture. I don't think they create a good culture uh, as much as um, you know having people be um, focused on the mission and understand what they're supposed to be working towards, uh, and obviously having good people, good good seeds in in the in the group. Um, the culture will take and it'll, it really becomes about, for me, culture is about people being able to answer very clearly the question of this is the way we do things. Uh, and, and, um, you know, I think culture and cult have become a little too synonymous. Um, we're, t- we're talking here about, I think about creating a professional business process around how to run an organization. Mm-hmm. Um, with with real inspiration and real mission, but not, you know, when you get cult, you get very highs and you get highs and lows within the organization. I think you're trying to maintain and grow a steady base of, again, how do people answer the question? Can they answer the question very clearly? This is the way we do things. And I think once you have that, um, then everyone just gets jumps on board and, and everything sort of gets very aligned and very clear. Right. That's, um, that's more important, I think, than, than most anything else. Yeah. You know, a culture is almost like, you know, you know, how obviously everybody has a personality. Culture is is kind of the personality of the business, right? That's correct. And, and you know, um, when you think about it, um, it, and I said this about ping pong tables or whatever, but for the most part, those are, those are without questions, um, symptoms of or results of a good culture, uh, not something that can right. create a culture. Yeah, yeah, I completely agree with you. Now, I, I really like the the four questions. That's a brilliant uh, a filter of way of a way to look at things that really, you know, I, I what happens is when a when a business really starts scaling, this this intangible synergy starts happening right and Mm -hmm. it's hard to put your finger on what it is but it's just the compounding effect of success and and so the side effect of that is a lot of opportunities comes your way and the the opportunities can become a full-time job just listening to what they are and i I love the brilliance of the four questions because it allows you to take all of those opportunities, whatever they are, and and run them through a, a simple four question filter, and uh, and make a quick decision as to whether it aligns with what you're doing and what you're what you're going after or not. And and if it doesn't, just put it to rest. And who come up with that idea? Um, without question, the. Uh, uh an evolution and one born out of necessity. I can tell you that we made some some pretty, I don't say bad, but not great decisions in our in our um, 
early going that uh, had I had I had the criteria, I probably uh, wouldn't have made them. And so I think just doing some evaluating, you know, I spend a lot of time reflecting on decisions and, and work. Um, I spend a lot of time doing sort of post mortems. Uh, I also do pre we also do pre mortems on decisions as well. But um, I do spend a lot of time sort of observing and saying, you know, what is, what happened. And um, and it, it it got born out of uh, sort of some you know, evolution of, of saying how do we go wrong with that decision or how do we go right with this one and at some point we we started asking some questions about ourselves and, and why would we do something and what are the criteria we would need to um, to make a good decision and at some point we said what are the criteria we need to make in what order do we need to ask questions in order to successfully make a good decision. So um, that's how it came about. Um, and I think it was pretty much a group effort. It was just sort of came out of necessity and we sort of needed to, we definitely needed to, to make better decisions mm-hmm. and not, not, replic- not replicate the mistakes, you know, we've had uh, in the past. And everyone makes mistakes and the question is whether or not you learn from them. You know, as, uh, uh, I forget who it was, but I think it's, uh, I think it was, someone said only make new mistakes. Right. Um, I think that's a, that's a, Good really piece of advice. And, yeah, and it gets it gets people. I think I think it frees people up right. uh, to to not feeling like they can't make one mistake, but just if you make a second one. Right, right. I completely agree. So, and then the next one, decide how you run the business. So, uh, is is you know, I in my businesses, there's a couple of things I come up with immutable laws to where you know if you lie or steal, that's the end of our relationship. And uh, sure. And and then you know you you run you you decide to run your business with a certain uh, you know a, a level of integrity and principles and all these other things and, and fully knowing that nobody's perfect and nobody ever will be perfect right but uh, yeah. but I I feel like that that's kind of the framework and the 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 thought process that you're talking about when you say decide how you run the business am I correct there? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the get a board of advisors is is can the average business afford that? Is it is it expensive or, or go deeper on that with me? Well, you'd be surprised. Um, 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 you know, you'd be surprised how many people are willing to help out uh, if you ask, mm-hmm. and also if you have a. Um, if you're if you're on a mission yourself, if you've got you know a real focus and they 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 just buy into what you're doing, you'd be really surprised how much people are um, are interested in helping out. Um, I think that that maybe evolved in the last uh, ten years or so. But uh-huh. um, you re- you reach out to people, you know, create a good network, reach out to people. Um, you know, someone says no, then they say no. That's it. Move on and, and find someone who will say yes. And um, I think there are enough really good people out there. Right. We're willing to spend some time with you, um, you know, and and um, really help you uh, um, grow your business in very specific terms. But you have to be, you have to use their time wisely, and you have to, um, you know, ask them very specific questions, and you have to understand what it is that you're looking for. Uh, but you know, I think at the end of the day, um, there, there's enough. You only need a couple of people to really give you some advice. And one of the things that I've always learned is you should be asking people. You know, I think uh, people who have experience ask them less about what to do, but you should really be asking them um, what are the things I shouldn't be doing, and what are the things I should avoid doing, what are the things I should be really wary of. You know, from from the from the experts, the things you should be looking at is asking them, um, you know, what kind of stuff do I not know that could be uh, catastrophic to my business. Um, everything else, I think. Uh, you know, you're going to know on your own. You're going to create on your own. If you don't, then it's going to become someone else's business. So, you know, you're really, really more more about um, finding out what you shouldn't be doing. Excellent advice. I I completely agree with you. Let's. And uh, by the way, a lot of a lot, a lot of young entrepreneurs or a lot of new entrepreneurs, I should say, um, don't like hearing what they shouldn't be doing because they're oftentimes so convinced that they should be doing it, and, <laughs> and it's, it's hard advice to take. But it's definitely uh, the one piece of advice that I scream from the from the, the mountaintops whenever I teach uh, or, or speak, and uh, it's because it's, it's 
really the most important thing. Yeah, it, it, part of the reason I believe is because it's not very sexy. You know, the uh, I'm I'm always miffed that very few people talk about the importance of a key performance indicators, metrics, measurement, all of those things that that scale a business. You know, if you don't measure things and track performance and seek to improve that performance, then there's no way that you can grow that business. Yet nobody talks about it because it's not sexy enough. And uh, right. yeah. And I think it falls in that same category of the the big gotchas that could completely wipe out your business and wipe out you personally if you're not protected. And so, yeah, I, I yeah, agree. yeah, they just don't get the uh, the airtime there. And let's transition to to something that was kind of the driving force behind what made you make this leap. And I know a little bit about it, just a fraction. But the uh, farm to table movement, I had I had watched. I want to say forks over knives or, or something something with Monsanto, where uh, I can't even remember what it was that the from table from farm to table it's the distance has quadrupled or maybe even more than that it's something like 55 miles now and and i think that your under an underlying piece of your business model is focusing on using local uh farmers and in businesses to uh to provide the supplies for your business is that correct uh, in, in some regard, yes, and it's, it's, it's mostly correct. I think um, one of the things that I spend a lot of time um, parsing in, in the way people talk about our business is, you know, at the end of the day, we, we started this business um, because we wanted to bring food that chefs are used to making um, to a larger audience, and there are very few people who are doing that. And one way we thought about doing that was, was through a sandwich shop. We love sandwiches. Um, they're truly the most, you know, portable lunch out there, and right. um, uh, and they're also uh, really, uh, you know, we, we felt like you could get a whole meal inside of a sandwich, right? And so um, we thought this is a great opportunity to communicate, uh, you know, what translate when you really get on a plate in a fine dining restaurant into really between two slices of bread, and, and the bread is part of the ingredients, so not just, uh, you know, uh, simple simple bread. So. For us, um, it was first about being great chefs and, and being able to to put them into um, you know, into, a, into an affordable, accessible meal. Mm-hmm. What, what, what's important to know about that, though, is the principles upon which we sourced food and how we made food uh, at the level that we were all working at um, was not. It's not what was what is what was traditionally known in the chain. You know, world where right? in the fast, even the fast casual, uh, the fast food and, and, and quick service, they're, they're, they're two the worlds apart. The way chefs think about food and the way fast fast food thought about food are two different things. And so right. The gap is, you know, we, we were we weren't necessarily trying to bridge that gap, and we didn't think about it from local or organic or sustainable as much as that those were values and principles that just made sense to us as operators and chefs, um, and. And, and so the authenticity of it is, you know, we're not painting ourselves, we haven't painted ourselves in the corner as a strictly organic restaurant. We haven't painted ourselves in the corner as a strictly local restaurant because that has problems and people know it. You'd be eating beets and carrots and potatoes all winter long and you wouldn't have a very <laughs> successful business. And, and, and frankly, you would, you'd, you'd, be, you'd be kind of foolish to think that that's, how, that, that's really how the, the world works. Um, having said that, um, you know, we buy local when we can. I'm on the board of uh, the Green Market Association here in, in New York City. We run 53 green markets. We support 250 farmers, and we basically, have, in the last 10 years, have created one of the greatest economies uh, you know, that, was, that was previously undeveloped by supporting local farmers. Um, that range, you know, that range is uh, for people who appear in the green market, it's 100 miles, and, and for wholesale, it's 200 miles, and it's five states. Um, you know, at the peak of summer, we can get fresh green peanuts from the southern tip of New Jersey in the farmers market, which you can't, which is really neat. Um, having said that, for a chain to feed as many people as we do a day, uh, it would be very, very difficult to get enough of some of the ingredients from local sources at the in, in the ways in which they're produced. So, I think it's um, really important to make that clarification. I think that um, as this industry develops, particularly. You know, as an entrepreneur is concerned, just not only about his business, but about the industry and wanting to keep pushing.
pushing it forward, um, it's really important to, to look at all aspects of, of what goes into the, what, what went into our, our decision. And for us, it was about being chefs first, um, and, and not the type of chef you see on a, on a commercial on the side of a bus with a toque and a, and a chef coat, but people who work in some of the best restaurants in the world who wanted to bring that to a larger audience. And so, um, within that is all these other values that, uh, that, that you know, we don't start with them. We, with one of them, we start with all of them because that's what makes us up as great chefs. And that, and that definitely makes it uh, makes sense. It's kind of a mashup of, you know, using what's most available and what makes the best sense for you guys. Uh, well, you if you think about it, if you go, if you go back to if you go back to the heritage of what a restaurant was, it was, it was the, the restaurant comes from the word restore, and there used to be um, taverns that kind of were annexes on the sides of um, places where people stayed overnight when they're traveling, and those places didn't buy their food from purveyors, and they bought they, they grew their own food on locally. So, to the degree that the first great chefs were the biggest local boys, it made total sense, and. Um, at some point with, in the last, you know, I'd say 40 years, but really in the last 80 years, we've lost our connection to food completely because of industrialization and process, you know, and, and, and automation in, in farming and agriculture and, and other other parts of the system. And all we're trying to do is say, you know what, let's, let's strip out some of these middlemen, let's, let's get back to our roots, and this is how you make good food. Right. And so, how do you how do you maintain a good profit margin with with all of that? Because you know, obviously, some of the fast food places, the uh, you know, the the cost of food has not grown with inflation. So you know, really, food should cost a whole lot more than what it really does. And so, when- uh, so no, hold on. The, the price of food to the consumer has not grown with inflation, but the cost of food to the purveyor has actually in the last five years. Our, our, our prices, at least at the end of the spectrum that we're working off of, have gone up tremendously, which I think ties into your question of how do you, how do you maintain a good margin when that's happening? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, that's an erosion. Uh, you know, you're, you're explaining an eroding profit margin when, when the Correct. end user is not paying more for it. So, so how do you get around that? You've got to charge more for your, for your specialty sandwiches then, right? Um, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a simple one, right? Um, I think, though, there is a fine balance. So, you know, Chipotle was actually one of the first, I think, first leaders on this um, at, a, at a large scale when they, they really did make it a, a point. And I don't know if you remember this, but um, right after they went public, they, they made it a point of, of highlighting the fact that they had a higher uh, cost of goods sold uh, than, than, than anyone else in the industry. They actually took pride in that. And they weren't necessarily charging that much more uh, for their product compared to people serving a similar product in the marketplace. But what they highlighted was the fact that they were able to get you know, infinitely number more people through their line in a peak time and created such loyalty over the product um, that they were amortizing their, their other fixed costs and then mm-hmm. not trying to squeeze their margin on, on the variable cost, which is counter, a totally counter, counterintuitive business model uh, but one that when you look at it is actually pretty genius, right? So um, they're creating, you know, if, if value is, is uh, expectation minus perception, right, they've created extremely high value because your expectation uh, is of a certain variety, which is still pretty high, and then um, sorry, perception minus expectation, so it's, you know, their perception of what happens when you go there is much higher than what your expectation was going in. And um, it's faster, it's more food, it's you know, it's good service, um, and that equation is really important. What they're getting is huge volumes to the door, um, and they're amortizing other costs, whether it's fixed labor, because you only fit so many people behind the line if they're super productive and get food out quicker and the systems and process are better. Great. Um, they're fixing, you know, amortizing other fixed costs like rent and, uh, you know, other small but, but not insignificant fixed costs within the direct operating expense line and such like that. So uh, they're seeing outside margin growth, I think, through through hacking, you know, customer loyalty and, and, and higher volumes. And we do the same thing. We have a bunch of units that um, I'm just amazed at. You know, there's some of them are small and they, they crank out huge numbers and you look at them at the end of the month, you're like, that is, you know, if I could have the entire chain look like that, I'd be on a beach somewhere. But really, um, <laughs> 
it's you know it's quite a quite a brilliant uh, um, it's quite a brilliant model, and we've adopted that. And I think I think I'm never gonna never gonna try to discount my food. I'm never gonna try to cheapen my food or the products that go into it because then my customers won't respect me and trust me, and that's the loyalty I built up. And frankly, I'm actually gonna keep pushing on that. We're gonna you know we're really focused this year on figuring out how to use grass fed beef. Uh, Antibiotics got to, they got to come out of our proteins. They're, they're in, mm-hmm. you know, um, there's a lot of proteins out there where, where, and especially at scale, they're, they're very hard to, to get rid of. Um, so, so things like that, which are just going to drive the cost of food up, uh, I'm fine with, but I think people are, are looking for that. Right. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you. And your consumers notice when the buns or when the sandwiches are getting smaller, you know, the, that shrinking, shrinking things and, and, you know, given less and less and less value, you know, your, your, your clients, your, your, your customers notice stuff like that. So what I, what I hear from what you just said is, is you based on the value proposition that you're giving everyone, you have compelled them through such a high level of quality and value that they come in and buy from you more often. Yeah, and and they bring their friends and they tell them. You know, and so the and this is at the end of the day, um, this is a word of mouth business. It's a it's a bricks and mortar word of mouth business. And so um, it's I'd say you know people make a decision about where they're going to go to lunch when they're out the door with their office colleague, and someone says, "Where do you want to go?" And someone says, "Where do you want to go?" And I want to go to Witchcraft. I want to go. To, I want to go to Chipotle. And someone says, "Well, I'd rather go to Witchcraft." And anyone's like, "Great, let's go to Witchcraft." Right. And so. Um, I think that that kind of um, that right there is a way in which because someone might describe the type of sandwich they had last time when they were here convinces one more person to come. Now I just doubled my volume without having to do anything other than serving a, a very memorable meal. Right. And so that is you know that's powerful stuff, and I don't think um, you know anything anything else in particular. Um, I think in particular the um, cheapening your food is a race to the bottom, yeah. uh, and, and you're, you're just, you just know, you end up with um, bottom of the barrel ingredients, bottom of the barrel employees, and bottom right. of the barrel customers. Yeah, I agree. So. You know, I I wonder if you could come up with some 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 way that you could add a vir- virality loop to what you just said. Uh, you know, if if you could come up with some type of program or plan or something that rewards people for bringing, uh, for for spreading it, you know, I, there. If you could add a viral loop into that, you know, it would accelerate the growth even that much faster for you guys. I agree, and I think we so we talk about that a lot, and it's something we're working on right now. And actually, this is this is the place where I think technology uh, has uh, incredible power, or social media, I should say, has incredible power. You know, I, I don't necessarily think that uh, it has a tremendous uh, power to move people to to make a decision um, in the moment. I don't think people. Have, I don't think that's how people are really making decisions about mm-hmm. um, about where to eat right. um, every day. But I do think that if you can. Um, somehow connect with people through large social networks, really targeted such to to get them to become, like you said, um, people who are going to, you know, reward, we're gonna reward them for that. And they, they, they can become incredibly loyal for that and bring people and, and create a, become a magnet for the business, then uh, then that's powerful. So we're, we're, we're already been talking about uh, some idea like that. You know, once we recognize that, this wasn't a, you know, it, we, we see that right? fast food chains are some of the largest and, and most, uh, um, uh, we spend a lot of money in advertising on all types of things. And I think that that's, um, that's a, a model that has worked. It's not for us. We're not going to go out and spend a lot of money on advertising. Um, we're going to really, I think, work on ideas that are going to uh, continue to hone in on who our best customers are and have them bring and fuel the growth of the business. Yeah, you can't play that game with the big boys. You've you've got to find another way to do that. Um, 
Okay, so we're running a little long on time. I don't, I don't want to keep you too long. I know that you're, uh, you've got a lot of things going on. Let's segue into the lightning round. I've got the three questions that I sent over to you. Uh, are you ready to... I like the lightning yeah. yeah, I'm ready. I like the lightning round. I think that's great. <laughs> All right, cool. Uh, I can tell you're a high-energy guy anyway. So, uh, listen, what book or program made an impact on you related to business that you would recommend and why? Um, I would say... Uh, can I answer three of them? Uh, one of them sure. is the Toyota Way, and the other is the, the Mind of the Strategist, and the other is uh, Let My People Go Surfing. And they have different purposes. Toyota Way is all about business process and really talking about culture through business process, and I find it incredibly compelling. The Mind of the Strategist is just a genius approach to learning how to think about problems um, and um, maybe simple at this stage, but back when it was written, it was very in, in informative and, and intuitive. Um, and then let my people go surfing. If you if you've ever read it, it's 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 a great biography of one of the great companies who was mission driven and uh, didn't didn't take a lot didn't make a lot of um, bad choices about their their core values and uh, and they created business process around those core values, which is really fascinating stuff hmm. um, so that's a, very cool I, 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 I hadn't heard that last one let my people go surfing I'm gonna I'm, gonna, I'm definitely gonna check that out I love that I love that yeah, you, you should you should read it it's a great one um, I would throw in there for any anyone who wants to do um, operation you know franchising slash restaurant I would throw in the e-myth but uh, but didn't make a top three right right What's uh, what's one of your favorite tools or pieces of technology that you've recently discovered, if any, that you'd recommend to other business owners and why? I'd say when you once you start to get a group of people, a distributed group of people, Basecamp has been has been really invaluable uh, to us uh, in communicating and collaborating. Um, really, uh, probably probably tops. Uh, on my list of, of being able to keep track of, of everything that's going on in the business, especially once people get used to learning how to use it. Yeah, I agree with you. I use Basecamp also. I, I don't even know how I operated before I used Basecamp. <laughs> um, what famous quote would best summarize your belief or your attitude in business? Yeah, it's on uh, top of my list. I just go around quoting it all the time, but it's a, it's a Thomas Paine quote. Um, I don't know if you know, uh, you know, the author of Common Sense and mm-hmm. uh, one of the fathers of the revolution. And when you think about uh, it in context, um, is really, um, uh, you know, a long habit of not thinking something wrong gives it the false appearance of being right. Uh, and, um, and it goes on from there. But uh, basically, the idea that you should challenge everything, especially those, th- especially those things that have uh, for a long time, been a habit of the company. So once you once you start to create some structure in in an organization, what naturally happens is those the structures start to calcify, and those ideas and those principles start to cal- calcify. And uh, doesn't really hurt to to ask you know uh, to challenge them from time to time. In fact, uh, in Toyota Way, there's a principle of of asking why five times. So you just go get to the root cause of something. And I think it's important to do that with even the most fundamental aspects of the business on a regular basis. It's not a, you know, no business is set it and forget it. Uh, uh, most businesses are evol- should be evolving, uh, right. especially if they're going to continue to grow. And you need to be, con- in order to do that, you need to be questioning. Yeah, 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 great point. Uh, sounds like the voice of experience, and I've I've personally experienced the uh, the blunt edge of not uh constantly asking why and and letting letting the processes calcify like you said you know uh, all, all of a sudden you lose your equilibrium and and no longer are relevant in your market you know it's easy to wait it's it's easy to go from a, a market leader to trailing everybody because you're not staying in touch with what's current and what's working right now i i agree and frankly i, I was you know i think they're there was a period a couple of years ago where I felt that was happening to us, and so we we sort of turned it. I mean, we started to turn up the volume on, on on innovation. Right, good stuff. Hey, man, how do people connect with you? Uh, best way is my email address. Uh, it's Jeffrey J E F F R E Y at witchcraftnyc dot com. Uh, um, I'm a, they should have some patience. I, I, I actually only check email uh, a couple times a day. You know, not on it all day long. 
Um, but uh, I'll get back to people if they want to, if they have questions. Excellent, excellent. Thank you for that. Remember that you can find all the links to the books and the resources mentioned in the show in the show notes. Just go to rockstarentrepreneurnetwork.com. Before I close the show today, I want to ask you, are you pushing yourself hard enough that you're scared at times? I want to challenge you to take some time when you're alone and think about this on a deeper level and figure out what your comfort zone is within a certain part of your business that's been holding you back. And then I want you to come up with something that is outside of that comfort zone, something that you've been putting off, something that will help you get to that next level. And then when you do it, I want you to call the, my voicemail line right there on the website and tell me what it was. Every time you challenge yourself to get outside of your comfort zone and do, do something that really scares you, that keeps you awake at night, you expand your skill set and so many other things open up and there's so much more potential for you. So I just want you to think about that for a little while. And when you do it, give me a call and tell me about it. I want to celebrate that victory with you. My quote for today comes from John Wayne. And the quote reads, Courage is being scared to death, but saddling up anyways. This is Travis Lane Jenkins signing off for now. To your incredible success, my friend. Take care.